Good morning, church. Let's all stand together. Let's kick off the service here with there's nothing that our God can't do. Just one word, you calm the storm that surrounds me. Just one word, the darkness has to retreat. Just one touch, I feel the presence of heaven. Just one touch, my eyes were open to see. My heart can't help but believe. Come on. There's nothing that I got. Jesus. 
My God will come through always. Guys, go ahead and be seated. Wonderful, wonderful. Hey, I'm Randall. I'm uh, stepping in for uh, Pastor Eric this morning. He and Melissa and their family. 
taken a few days of much needed and much deserved uh, vacay, and so I get the privilege this morning to uh, share the word uh, with you uh, this morning. So uh, we're going to be in Revelation if you have a Bible or uh, an uh, app on your phone, either one. But four little verses there in just in a moment. If you've ever found yourself in prayer saying something like this, Lord, I don't know if I can take any more. Say, so, no, I don't think I've ever prayed that, or I don't think I've ever uh, made that kind of uh, statement. I would just say, hang on, <laughs> live a little longer. Because there is going to come a time to where you're going to feel like, okay. You know, I know the adage of he won't put on me any more than I can handle, and he must think my shoulders are really, really big. But he thinks more of me than I think of myself, and I just think that I'm absolutely at my limit. I want to introduce you then to a church found in Revelation that I want you to get acquainted with a little bit this morning. It's not as commonly known as, you know, the church in Ephesus or Corinth or Galatia or even the, of the seven churches mentioned here in this passage of which we will not read all of it, uh, even Laodicea because that always gets a lot of uh, airplay seemingly over the years. There's this little, at the time, a big city even for that day uh, called Smyrna. And I want to introduce this church to you and what Jesus said to that church. Jesus wrote a letter. He used John, his disciple, his, the apostle. He used John to dictate it, but the, but the letter of Revelation is actually from Jesus telling John what to write uh, to these churches. So let me uh, get you a little familiar with the background and the passage. So we've got these seven churches that Jesus addresses. In fact, is the whole letter of Revelation is to these churches, but we understand that they're for us today as well, and, and uh, just like, you know, we can gather from Galatians or Ephesians or whatever, but he specifically calls out these seven churches. Um, look there to the screen. Jerusalem will be a good frame of reference. John is on this little island called Patmos, and he has uh, been abandoned there, actually exiled there, and he's writing this letter to those churches. It's about... Uh, um, Smyrna is about 40 miles uh, north of uh, Ephesus, and this is where John writes the letter of Revelation. And he, and he addresses each of these churches, and just one of them I want to uh, mention uh, to you today. A little bit more background. So he was exiled by Domitian, the, uh, the emperor. John writes this letter around 95 AD. Let that sink in just a little bit. John is probably close to a hundred years old. When the average, now we say the average life expectancy in the first century, and it was quite low, but there was a lot of infant deaths, and so it sort of brings the average down. But still, you, you were considered an old man at 30 and 40 years old. And so for John to live to be a hundred, it's almost like he's lived two lifetimes. And so those events of John remembering walking with Jesus when he was a younger man back in the day, I mean, those, that's been, it's been 60 years. When John writes Revelation, 60 years has passed. There may have been some, and you think about Jesus' earthly ministry was three and a half years, right, in a really condensed area in and around, you know, from Nazareth and, and just up along the Jordan River. There might have been some young family traveling uh, in that area, and you know there may be some young kid by the time John writes this that can remember Jesus, but I think you could make a pretty good argument, and historians will tell you, or, or commentators will say, when John walks in the church at almost 100 years old, like it's an anomaly, because he can remember Jesus, like personally, individually. What attracted me to these churches in Revelation to start with, is when I, you know, as far as the, doing the study, was the fact that, by and large, all of them are sort of operating like we're operating today. 
None of them were working off of firsthand knowledge by this time. Very few of them would have said, oh yeah, I remember when Jesus rose. No, I mean, by this time, most of them are gone, and especially in this region here. And so when John walks in, man, I mean, he's, you're talking about a, wor- a wealth of knowledge. And can't you imagine, like, the questions that you would have for him about Jesus? I mean, we know about his life, and the other gospel writers had written by this time, and so they were well acquainted with the life of Christ. But there was a lot of stuff. It's like, you know, what was his humor like? That's what I would want to know. You know, like, and, and how about just like how he walked and the, the, the gait of his steps and the accent and just like all of these little things that Scripture tells you nothing about. John would have that firsthand knowledge. And so when he walks in, he's speaking to a group of people who have only heard about. And by this time, it's, well, I heard it from so-and-so and they heard it from so-and-so and quite possibly they heard it from so-and-so. And now 2,000 years removed, you and I gather most every Sunday, and we talk about what we've heard about. Somebody said, this said, they said, and it goes all the way back to the life of Christ. So when you're reading the letter of Revelation, and you're reading these words that Jesus said to Smyrna, you're reading something that has had time to sort of like age really, really well. And I love this. When you read the book of Revelation... John does something that I don't believe I could do other than, the, other than claiming that you are under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. John never brings up, m- never makes a reference to, oh, I remember when we were. I remember it. He does, you know, I, I would be throwing that around everywhere I went, wouldn't you? Like, oh yeah, me and Jesus, we did this together, and me, and I was the one that he loved, and I remember I outran Peter, and, and you know, and, and, and don't ever forget, Peter denied him, and you know, I'd just be, I'd be trying to throw everybody else under the bus, and I'd be dropping Jesus' name everywhere I went. John never does any of that in Revelation. He never makes any reference to the moments that he walked with Jesus. In fact, the way he speaks of Jesus is high and lifted up. Almost like he has had 60 years to let it set in that I walked with God. I mean, they all knew that they were walking with the Messiah when he was here. But you gotta, you know, you just gotta like give them give them a break because they understood he is the chosen one, he is the Messiah, but in their minds that was for right now in this moment. And Jesus is going to overthrow the Roman government and one of us is going to be on his right and the other is going to be on his left and we're going to bring the glory of Israel back. And, And his disciples tried so hard to get him engaged in that effort. It took a while for John to realize, you know, It was more than just this moment. It was for every moment. And he wasn't just the Messiah of Israel. He was God in the flesh. And he walked among us. And we beheld his glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And so when you're reading Revelation, like you can, it it just, it has that smell of almost this unbelievable reverence when he speaks of Jesus. And in no way does he try to show himself even a little bit as I was one of his closest pals or friends. No, Jesus is high and lifted up in John's estimation. And it's taken like this long for it to to settle on him like we were walking with him and talking with him. Yes, I knew that he was the Messiah of Israel, but like, God in the flesh and the Savior of the world, not for just this time, but for all time. And you see that as you're reading Revelation. Smyrna today is called Izmir. It's actually the only city still in existence from the other that we mentioned. I mean, those places are still there, but they're under rubble and and civilization has grown up in and around it. At the time, about 100,000 people. It was known for its myrrh, that's where the name comes from, and they were the greatest export of it, quite possibly the myrrh that was presented to Jesus as a baby, and the myrrh that was mingled with the vinegar given to him at the cross would have come from this city. This city was rich, 
And even you can look up pictures today, absolutely beautiful. And it was rich and beautiful when John is writing to the Christian church there in Smyrna. Again, he writes at about 95, and quite possibly he's going to mention where Jesus says to the angel of, which is messenger and or the pastor of the church, because Jesus addresses the pastors to tell the pastors what to say to these churches. We don't know like you know, who those pastors were at the time, but they say smart. It could have well been Polycarp, because we know Polycarp was John's direct disciple, and we know that he pastored the church in Smyrna for a very long time, maybe like five decades. He also lived to be like 80-some, 80 86 years old. And it was quite possible when John was writing this that his disciple, his young student, had already taken over the church there, was the pastor of the church there. And so like it, when he got to Smyrna, it's like, this one I know, like, I mean, he knew all of them. But like, this, this is being pastored my, by my uh, student pastor, the one that followed me around. This fellow by the name of Polycarp, I'll come back to him in just uh, in a little bit. Four things I would love for you to know about the letters we read it. It is the shortest of the seven. So when he addresses the church at Smyrna, it is the shortest. It's just four verses. And I'm going to read them to you in just in a moment. It's very narrow in scope and content. In other words, he doesn't cover a lot of stuff. Some of the things Jesus covers in the other letters addressing the other churches, it's a little bit shotgun. Like, you know, it just covers this, and then he covers several things. When he's addressing Smyrna, it's like, I know exactly where you are, and I know exactly what you're going through, and you don't have the, you don't have the, the, the bandwidth to consider a lot of things. I want to talk about this one thing. So it's short, it's uh, to the point, and it's sweet. It is one of the only, uh, two, one of the two that, that Jesus has no rebuke for. The other five churches, along with uh, this one, along with Philadelphia, the other five churches, Jesus has compliments for them and also rebuke. He would say, I love this about you, I know this about you, but here's some things I have against you, and here's some things I want you to straighten out, here's some things I want you to take care of. That's what he would say to the other five churches. When he's talking to Smyrna, just like Philadelphia, he's got no rebuke for them. I mean, can you imagine as a church getting like, as a grade, like it's A++, and you walk out like, but well, wait till you see what they've had to do to get the grade. It's the one, I love this about it, it's the one that he has the most in the moment feel because he uses this phrase, and you'll see it in a few moments, he uses this phrase, you are about to go through something. The other churches, he sort of speaks to them in summary. Like here's, here's this overarching theme about your church. And he gives this like big, broad summary, like, you know, this is what I know about you. Here's the things I want you to work on. But when he's talking to Smyrna, it's like, I'm right here with you. And I'm going to tell you some things that are about to happen like almost next week. So Smyrna is the only one that you get this sense of real time, very present, I am right here, and here's some things that I want you to consider. And this, the other thing about this letter that causes it to stand out from the others, it's the only passage to where Satan and the devil are mentioned in the same passage. Now, Satan and devil are the same person, but Satan is sort of more like the office. The devil is like the individual. Satan can, sometimes Satan can represent like, all the forces of evil or whatever. But when he says devil, that's like, that's the, the, the person. And so what John is saying to the church at Smyrna is, yeah, the forces of Satan hate this church because of your faithfulness. But he says, but the devil is actually like the devil individually, because you know this, the devil is not God. He can't be everywhere at the same time, right? He's not all-knowing. So if he's working on you, he's not, he's not working on me. Now, he has, you know, sort of uh, imps and cohorts of hell and all of that, but, but, but chances are none of us have, like, directly faced the devil himself. And yet Jesus says to Smyrna, the devil himself is in this city. 
working against you. Now, I'm going to read the passage to you in just in a moment, but I want you to see this uh, in Revelation 1-3, because it's unlike any other letter. It's a special promise. I understand that the Lord is always with us. The Lord's here right now, and so to say, Lord, hey, come meet with us or make your presence known or, you know, like he's already here. But he does say that there are some, there are some environments and in some moments when I will show up in a special way where two or three are gathered together in my name. That doesn't mean when those two or three leave that they leave the presence of the Lord. You can't get away from the presence of the Lord. We know that, right? But we also know that when we gather together in his name, it's like this special promise that he gives us. Well, here is a special promise that we get from the letter of Revelation. I know that the Lord blesses all of his word. But John says this, blessed, blessed is he who reads, and that word reads in the Greek is like oratory, that's who reads aloud, that's what I'm about to do. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and they keep those things which are written in it, they protect them, they guard them in their heart, for the time is near. I just think it would be um, malpractice for me to read the passage this morning and not draw your attention to this verse because there is a special blessing that goes when the letter of Revelation is read aloud and folks and, and someone reads it and somebody hears it. Say, so, well, what does that mean? You, you, you sort of translate that for yourself that the Lord has a blessing for you this day in what you're about to hear, not because me, but because his word is being read. And this particular passage, though we are not going to read the entire letter of Revelation. I've thought like, Lord, why do you put this here for this letter? And you know what? In a practical sense, and this is just my opinion, so take it for what it's worth, Revelation is not the most practical book in the entire Bible. It's not like, oh, I get, you know, here's some great things about marriage and child rearing. And, you know, it's not like Ephesians for the walk. And it's almost as if like the Lord is saying through John, look, I get it. There's a lot of analogies and a lot of imagery here, and there's a lot of things that you know, people will argue for the, until, I, until Jesus comes back to straighten it all out. But in the meantime, get acquainted with it, and I will accompany it with this special blessing when you hear it read or when you read it aloud yourself. I'm going to read it for us and uh, talk about some of these words that are highlighted just a little bit. And to the angel of the church in Smyrna, right, this is Jesus telling John, this is what I want you to write. These things says, and he's talking about uh, who's, who's talking here, he's de Jesus is describing himself. These things says the first and the last who was dead and came to life. He says this to Smyrna as he says to all the other ones as well. He says, I know your works. I'm not talking about hearsay, Jesus would say. I'm not talking about something I heard. I'm speaking from knowledge. I know your works. I know what you're in and what you're going through. And then he uses this word tribulation, which is an interesting word uh, in the Greek. It actually has to do with a specific type of torture. So Jesus says, I know your works, and I know what you're up against. And what, this, uh, what, the, what they were known for, like the, uh, uh, you know, 60-some years earlier, like the crucifixion was the big thing, this was a crushing. What they would do is they would take these Christians and they would lay them down on the ground and then pull their arms out and rope them down so they could not bring their arms in and their feet so they're, they're roped to the ground, and then they would set big flat rocks on their chest. And it was a betting game to see how many rocks they could pile on their chest before you, before you smothered, because you would, once you exhaled, you couldn't uh, inhale again. And so they would put a big flat rock on your chest, and then you would continue to breathe, and then they would pile another one, and another one, and another one. And all those around would be betting to see what, uh, which rock it was that crushed your chest or would smother you and not allow you to breathe. That's the word there. Crushed 
and smothered, struggling to breathe. And Jesus says to the church there in Smyrna, I know what you're going through. I not only know what you're going through, but I'm not like generalizing it. I know exactly what you're going through. And they all feared that type of ending for their life. And he said, now know your poverty. There's two types of poverty or two Greek words for poverty in the scripture. One is a sort of a day laborer po- a poverty, just trying to make ends meet and not have, you know, you're not a landowner, but you got a little n- uh, enough to get by. And then there's another word for poverty that is like abject poverty, like utter uh, destitute. That's the poverty here. He said, I know what you're going through. And the, and the type of poverty. And listen, it was a poverty. It would be one thing to be poor in a poor country. But it's another thing to be super poor in a very rich, affluent country. When you can see all around you, like there is, there is just stuff and blessing and all kinds of, you know, all kinds of stuff all around you. All kinds of abundance. And you are in destitute poverty. I mean, you know how that's got to play on your mind? Like, Lord, do you see this? So it's not for a lack. It's not like the whole country is in a famine right now, and we're all suffering together. But Jesus says this, and I love it. You can find this because they didn't do parentheses like in uh, Greek, but you can even find old Greek manuscripts that have the parentheses here. Jesus says, but you are rich. Now, you contrast that because he tells Laodicea, he says, you think you're rich, but you're actually poor. But with Smyrna, he says, you see poverty all around you, but Jesus says, I want you to know, and he puts it in parentheses as like this, is, like this statement can stand alone. He says, but you are rich. Now, dear friend, if that's coming from anybody other than Jesus, those would seem like really empty words. But Jesus wants the church in Smyrna to understand, I know what you're going through. I know that you feel like you are, you are struggling to breathe literally. But I want you to know you're rich. And he says, I know the slander or the blasphemy that's going about you. And what was big because of those Jews who say they're Jews, but they're not? Because the Roman Empire was judging this sect of Christians, sort of, they were lumping them all together. Like, oh yeah, you guys are just a splinter of the Jewish synagogue. And the, and the Jewish synagogue said, no, 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 they're not, they're not us at all. And so the, Jew, the Jewish synagogue, the leaders of the Jewish synagogue were going around saying they practice cannibalism. And they got that from our communion. And so they went up about all the, all the city of Smyrna saying, yeah, they practice cannibalism. They eat uh, the flesh of their, of their uh, leader and they drink his blood. And obviously the Christians were trying to explain the symbolism of it and the meaning of it or whatever, but just slander is slander. And people who want to believe the worst about you are going to believe the worst about you. And yet this is what they faced, and so they lost their jobs. Smyrna was one of those towns where it had like, a, it would be considered today like the modern day unions or whatever. They had these, uh, they, these um Worker guilds that in order for you to join and to get any work in the town uh, doing anything, you had to worship the gods that they all said to worship. And so the Christians in Smyrna would not worship those gods. They would not bow to false idols. They would not worship the emperor himself. They're being slandered against and tortured. He says this in uh, verse 10, do not fear. Any of those things which you are about to suffer. (laughs) Can you imagine? Because you think with the lead up like Jesus says, I know and I know and I know. But then he says, but it's going to get worse. And you're like, I don't, Lord, are you, but you are about to suffer. Indeed, he says, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested and you will have tribulation 10 days. And you say, well, that doesn't seem like a whole lot. Let me explain to you the significance of 10 days. The the number one theme throughout the entire letter of Revelation is sevens. 
seven, almost like seven everything. There's these seven churches, and there was the, 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 the seven seals and the seven thunders, and there's just like 50-some sets of sevens throughout Revelation. And so seven means like perfect or mature or completely full. Uh, it's, like, it's like at its most ripe. And so when you use the word seven, it's like this is at its, it, this is at its height. This is its full. So when they heard 10, that was like seven plus three more. That was like at seven you would be full like this has got to be the worst. And John says, through the inspiration, writing on Jesus' behalf, it's like, it's going to go on a lot longer. In fact, we know through history, looking back, it lasted a couple hundred years. Just this, there, quite possibly no church has suffered like this church. Would it sort of surprise you that today... Present day, there are more Christians in Izmir or Smyrna than in any of those other places. Because it seemed like the more they were persecuted, the larger their church grew. Can you imagine Smyrna's marketing? Hey, come join us. And then you'll be, what, stretched and piled on with rocks? You'll face Satan head on. And yet the church continued to grow. And then that's why the tribulation or that's why the persecution was heated so much because it seemed like all the devil could get uh, wicked leadership to do that the church just continued to grow and grow. Jesus says this, be faithful unto death. Translation, you're not getting out of it. And I will give you a crown of life. And then he says this. And this is, he says this to all seven of the churches. But to me, it like it, it's, it's never any more sweeter than when it's said to Smyrna. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. Translation, they can only kill you once. And then there's an eternity. And a million years from now, when you're in the, in the presence and glory of Jesus, you'll look back to those, Polycarp lived 86 years, okay, let's just 80 some years, and it is going to be certainly a vapor of time compared to the millions of years out set before us. But he says, but you need to hear the Spirit and what He has to say. So, dear friend, all those who feel like you are struggling to breathe, poverty and lack are increasing an increasing reality in your life. And if you've ever found yourself in a place to where you think this has gone on way too long, let me ask you to consider four things. Number one, be careful who you give a listening ear to. Listen to the Spirit of the Lord, what He's saying. Because no suffering, no grief, no heartache needs to go to waste. And the Lord will use it. Say, Pastor or preacher, I, I don't understand how in the world. And to be, to be quite honest, dear friend, that's not what He promises. But he promises to take it and to use it for his good and for his glory. You may get to see that in your lifetime. And you may get to see like how it all worked out, but you may not. It may, it, you may have to wait till you get to heaven. And in fact, the pain and the suffering that you're going through now, the, the, the goodness from that can reverberate for generations after you're gone. What you're going through now will affect, and how you respond to it will affect your children and grandchildren and so on and so forth. But be careful who you listen to. Because sometimes there are some well-meaning Christians 
who, especially in sort of Western Christianity, we don't know what to do with suffering. Because sometimes we'll say, well, you just got to pray more. Or you just got to be more faithful, or you just got to show up more, or you just got to get more involved, or, or as if there's something you can do that will trigger it. As if you're going to get to heaven one day, and Jesus is going to say, boy, if you'd have just prayed one more time, all of the blessings were about to be... Who are we talking about? That is not how a loving heavenly father treats his children. He doesn't manipulate us. He doesn't play games with us. We're not a science like, like a project with him. Just to, I just, I'm just curious to see what he can take. That's not your heavenly father. He knows what you're going through. The answers may not be able to be grasped in this moment. But God is not like the, like the Roman gods, you know, to where they were all just playing with, like little insects. No, this is your heavenly father you're talking about. Listen to his voice and what the Spirit has to say. Jesus, the one who knows, is the one who gets the last eternal word. Because when he says, I know what you're going through, I know what you faced, I know what you feel, but you're rich. Again, that could, be, that could be empty words if it came from anybody else because you would just say, oh, he's just trying to make me feel good. No, this is the teacher who gives the grade. Jesus says, I know you feel like you're failing, but I'm telling you, you've got an A++. And the only one that matters is him because he's the one that gets to decide the results. So dear friend, understand when he says, I know what you're feeling, I know what you're going through, and I'm telling you, this is tough. But you're rich, and you have a crown of life waiting for you. And it will be like it's going to be beyond worth it. That's the voice that you want to listen to. I say this, you can honor Christ no matter the reason behind your suffering. A lot of times we feel like, yeah, but, yeah, uh, Randall, I'm going through some stuff, and I, you know, suffering may be a heavy word, but it may not be. It may, it may very accurately uh, define what you're going through. But it's not like because I'm standing up for Jesus or I'm preaching the gospel and they're trying to shut me down, and it's not like I'm imprisoned for the cause. Hear me. Suffering is suffering. And when you do it, when you go through it and, and keep strong faith pointing people to Jesus, friend, it has a louder, more impactful uh, effect on people when you speak up for Jesus, when they know you're personally going through a tough time. It's honorable. It doesn't have to be the missionary risking his life on a foreign field who could potentially find, you know, like be martyred for the cause. Yes, all of those like are, you know, we honor all of those. But I'm talking to folks who are just going through some stuff, maybe a sickness that you never signed up for. And you say, how's this helping the kingdom of God? It gives a tremendous impact to testimony when you speak up for the Lord, when you yourself are going through some stuff. And you can honor Christ through the suffering, no matter like the motive or the reason behind it. Finally, I would say to you, never stop praying, even while you're persevering. Just because I'm encouraging you to persevere and to keep the faith. That doesn't stop us from praying for breakthrough and for freedom. That doesn't stop us from praying for healing. In fact, if you want to have, ever have a good read, get you some like Fox's Book of Martyrs or something like that, and you read these stories of these people who went through tremendous uh, tribulation, and there are miracles sprinkled all about it. Polycarp, the guy I mentioned, he evaded capture for like five, over 50 years 
Miracle after miracle after miracle. It was like, you know, you can try to snuff him out, but until the Lord's done with you, they finally, they finally got a hold of him at 86 and was going to burn him at the stake. When Polycarp finally came down to it and was like tired of running and just felt like, you know, hey, I've, you know, I've done my thing. One of his, one of his uh, people came to him and said, the soldiers are coming. Polycarp prepared a meal for the soldiers that were going to come to take him. And when the soldiers walked into his home, he had a meal prepared for them. And he said, I ask you just to enjoy this food and allow me to pray my last hour. And those soldiers had enough mercy on him to allow him to do that. And like any good preacher, he prayed for two hours. (laughs) And some of those soldiers that heard him pray in the next room could no longer be a part of this thing. And yet a few of them still did. And they took him. And they, and they were going to nail him to the cross because they were going to set him on fire and they didn't want him trying to jump out or whatever. And he said, you, no need for nails. He said, I will not move. And he embraced the stake as the cross. And they lit him on fire. And the winds blew so much that it never touched his body. And the fire kept getting put out by the wind, kept getting put out by the wind, kept getting put out by the wind. And when they realized we're not going to get what we want here and and be able to watch him burn, one of the soldiers came up and just stabbed him and he he died instantly. But before they lit the flame, they asked him, do you want to recant? Do you want to pledge your allegiance to the emperor? And Polycarp said, 80 and 6 years, Have I served him? And he's never done me wrong. How in this moment could I deny my king who saved me? Dear friend, I ask you to persevere. I ask you to listen to the Spirit of the Lord. And at the same time, I ask you to pray. Continue to pray for freedom. Continue to pray for breakthrough. Continue to pray for healing. Absolutely, that is, I'm not, I'm not saying just concede to the situation you find yourself in. Lift your voice to the Lord. There's nothing wrong with that. But just understand that sometimes he has us in a place where he knows where we are. He knows what we're going through. And he gets to decide the grade and the result. And how a thousand years from now, you'll be glad that you were faithful till the end. Would you stand with me, please, for a moment? I'm going to ask the band to come back um, and sing a third and final song, a little different maybe uh, than a a typical Sunday. They'll sing all the way through it. Actually, it's a prayer. And so they're going to sing a prayer over you. At the end of it, James will dismiss us and most folk will leave, but I'll stand over here. My wife will stand over there. If uh, you're carrying in a burden this morning, we would love to pray with you about that before you leave. I just don't want you to leave with the same burden. We know that we are commanded by the Lord to bring our burdens to him. I feel like we do pretty good with that. I think where we struggle is leaving them with him. I don't want you to take it with you. Give it to him. If you can resonate with the message this morning and you feel like, hey, I know a little bit about what the church in Smyrna is going through while they sing this song, this prayer over you, just receive this prayer uh, into your heart. And uh, again, afterwards, Most of us will leave, but we'll stick around. We'd love to pray with you about what uh, the burden that you're carrying upon your heart this morning. God bless you.